interact with anybody out there that's uh, working hard on the various Bible questions that are flashing by us on the internet day after day. Some of them, I think, unnecessarily complicated. So let's see what we can do today. If you have something on your mind, let us know. Otherwise, we'll think of stuff. We'll go with the first question. Mm -hmm. if, we, if Jesus was not in the beginning with the Father, <laughs> uh, as the Word of God or the Logos, mm. how is Hebrews 2, 9 to be understood, which says, but we see him for a little while was, while, a little while mm. was made lower than the angels, mm -hmm. namely Jesus, yes. crowned with glory, honor mm. because of the suffering of death, yes. that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Yes. Well, that's a perfectly plain statement, it's talking about Jesus, who was for a little while living on the earth in the days of his flesh, as Hebrew says, and saying about him pre-existing himself. You see, we have in all of these questions to put our stake in, in the fundamental and impressive evidence, starting with the Old Testament and, of course, with Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke give us a discourse on who Jesus is and how he came into existence. So, once we ground ourselves in Luke 1.35, which says that the one being begotten will be the Son of God precisely because of that miracle. That's the reason he's brought into existence. Notice carefully Matthew 1, 18 and 20. The 18th verse there speaks in the best text about the genesis of Jesus. And 1, 20, when Joseph is uh, worried about how Mary is getting pregnant in an unmarried state, the angel steps in and makes a definitive statement about who Jesus is how, when, why he is the Son of God. This must be our base. It's no good then trying to contradict that with other much less clear passages. This passage in Luke 1.35 goes like this, or let's do Matthew 1.20, first of all. Key verse. There's a little bit of a fog in your translations here. That which is begotten in her is from the Holy Spirit. That's the point. To beget is to cause to come into existence. Guess what? If you're coming into existence, you aren't already existing. This would be a transformation. If you've already existed, suppose you're an angel pre-existing or God the Son pre-existing, then you're not coming into existence at all. That would be sheer contradiction. No, Mary was not up to that kind of theological stuff that came many years later. The Son of God begins to exist in the womb of Mary. That's Matthew 1.20. That which is begotten in her. Yenao to yenithen. The one that is begotten, passive, of Yanao to come into existence, to bring into existence, all of that is coming from God's Spirit as a miracle. Nothing at all in those wonderful accounts about a so-called pre-existing person. You know, you cannot be human and pre-human. You can put on a sort of facade, but you're not genuinely human if you've existed for billions of years before that. So, let's keep this very simple. Second Samuel 7 listed in, in the wonderful proof text in Hebrews 1, speaks of a son of David who's going to be in the future. I will be his father, he will be my son. That's exactly Psalm 2, 7. This day I've begotten him. Also in the LXX, the Septuagint version of Psalm 110, verse 3, we have the same thing, and also in many manuscripts of the Hebrew text there too. I have become his father. There's a very slight difference between I've become his father, and the very obscure thing you have in your version of the Hebrew, something about his youth, Yaldutecha. Can you hear the difference in Yaldutecha, your youth, which is undoubtedly a fudged effort to get rid of the begetting, and what the text really said was, Yaliditecha, I have begotten you. It's a past tense of prophecy. God begets the son, so forget any idea about a pre-existing life before the womb. It's all to do with the womb. It's all to do with Mary being descended from David. There's no father there. God plays the part of father, not of course in a sexual sense in any way, but by miracle in her, he begets, brings into existence the Son of God. That's the base from which to work all the rest of the texts. Question, uh, Hebrews 2.10 yeah. uh, speaks of it speaks of our Lord Jesus, the founder of our salvation, mm. being made perfect through suffering. Yes. How would all things exist through him if he never existed before then? 
created or came into being at a later point in time? Yes, well, first of all, you can't pre-exist yourself. One has to be sure that in making theological propositions, one is saying something that is comprehensible, comprehensible. You cannot pre-exist yourself. It's a fog language for cover-up, really. Of course, Jesus was human. He was tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. He was tempted to see if he would make it to the end of his destiny, his commission, which was to be the sinless Son of Man. The whole point, and I mean the whole point of Scripture, is lost. If you turn him into half God, half man, or 100%, 100%, 100 God, 100% man, which is really a very difficult concept, you've lost the whole point of what God can do with a sinless human being. God was the father of Jesus by the miracle. That's perfectly clear. Luke knows nothing about pre-existence. Matthew knows nothing about pre-existence. Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer, slightly more than Paul even, he simply doesn't talk about any kind of non-human, pre-human Jesus. And along those lines, of course, we know that Jesus cannot be an angel. We have these definitive statements twice in Hebrews 1 we find that no angel can sit at the right hand of the Father. That's impossible. The one who's begotten is, not the, one, is the one who later sits at the right hand of the Father. But to no angel did God ever, ever, ever say, you're my son, I've begotten you. So no angel can be sitting at the right hand of the Father. Well, it isn't God sitting at the right hand of God. You're only left with one option. It's the man Messiah, and that's precisely what the Hebrew of Psalm 110.1 says, Yahweh speaks in an oracle about Adonai, my Lord, which is the non-deity title specifically. The human title couldn't be an angel. Hebrews 1 rules that out twice. Has to be a begotten human being. That's exactly who Jesus is. Now super exalted and waiting at the right hand of the Father until he comes back to suppress his enemies at his second coming, his parousia. Matthew 5.13, you mm. are the salt of the earth. Yes. If the salt loses its saltiness, yeah. how can it be made salty again? Mm. Okay, can you explain <laughs> how you understand this verse? Uh, yes, I, I, what I've read in the commentaries, I think makes perfectly good sense. That salt is a preservative, and so it's really preserving God's presence in the earth. When we have Christians who understand the truth, and I'm making that known. There's a preservation process. It's the only thing, frankly, that's saving the world is the truth as distinct from the chaotic state of the world in general. Now, none of us takes any credit, of course. We shouldn't take any credit. But God in his mercy has selected some few to see and understand in his provision. And that saltiness then is a preservative. A covenant of salt is a covenant I think is preserved. But you'll find the commentators in general will deal with that in more detail. Look online, if you have your own library, second-hand books can be purchased rather cheaply. The Tyndale Bible Commentary, the pulpit commentary can be uh, possessed quite easily these days. If you've got the finances to do that, then of course the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament is superb. The one behind me, ten volumes, or one volume is better than nothing. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. The word biblical commentary is the state of the art in evangelical scholarship. Those sort of points are dealt with more extensively than I can manage without looking some of that up in more detail. But salt is a preservative, I think is the point there. Okay, the next one is, could you comment mm. on the JW teaching mm. uh, based on Acts 15, 20 and 29? about ingesting blood or blood oh, yes. or donate. Oh, yes. Well, that's interesting. In, uh, yeah. Well, yes, I don't think blood transfusion is anything remotely to do with anything that Moses or the Bible ever conceived. So uh, you don't need to worry about that. If you're going to be dying but for the taking in of some blood given generously by some donor, I'd go for it. Eating blood is quite a different category from taking blood to save your life in an accident. So I really think it's a misuse of scripture to try to connect those two things. I notice that the Jehovah's Witnesses have lightened up on this quite a bit. They're allowing for some sort of blood transfusion now. So just a misconception, I would think. I don't think Paul or Moses or the Bible writers have that kind of procedure in mind at all. So 
So what is it about? Well, they're talking about kosher foods there, I would think, quite clearly, because these, some, some of these people are still attending the synagogue, and they're hearing about kosher foods. Now, you don't want to offend a Jew who's weak at that point. Now, the whole issue of foods, of course, is very clear in Paul. It took these people a while to get used to this. James was perhaps a little bit slower than Paul, who got there first. Peter was slower. He had to be rebuked by Paul to get this right. But the issue of food is very clear. In Romans 14, Paul instructs us not to be hasty, impatient with people who are vegetarians. That's their conviction. They're new to the faith. Don't make that the issue that keeps them away from the faith. Some people drink wine, some don't. Those are not issues to be tackled right at the start. But Paul is very clear that we are to become strong as he is strong. So in Romans 14, this is the clincher, Romans 14 verses 14 and 20, you have this. I, Paul, he's speaking about himself, I, Paul, and note he's a Jew, and note he's a Christian, a true Christian, I am convinced that nothing is unclean of itself. I simply put it to you that nobody in his senses could write that way if he's trying to enforce the Levitical food laws. It's just impossible. I, Paul, the Christian and believer, am convinced in my own mind that nothing is unclean of itself unless you think it's unclean. At which point then your conscience is weak. You aren't there yet. Move forward in the faith. Be like Paul. Be strong. Get to the point where you are quite convinced that those food laws were not essentially health laws anyway. Even the rabbis say that. They're not distinctions that are binding in the New Testament. And then in the 20th verse of Romans 14, even more explicitly, Paul says, all things are kathara, clean. That's the opposite word to akathartos, unclean, which is listed in Leviticus 11. I mean, really, could Paul be clearer? Paul is very radical. It may take you time to come to this. Note that in Galatians, Paul says, if you get circumcised, don't do it. If you do, wrongly, then you're going to have to be obliged to keep the whole law. Now people say, well, you're saying the whole law was done away with. We must make distinctions here. There's a law of love, loving your neighbor, loving God and so on. The laws of chastity uh, against fornication, drunkenness, which are absolutely perpetual. That's quite clear. But Paul has a law in mind. Those laws which distinguish you from, uh, as a Jew, from the rest of the world. Those are the things which you don't want to observe. Now note the radical thing that Paul has done here. In Genesis 17 it says that everybody must be physically circumcised, all the males, whether they're Jews or Gentiles wanting to be part of the covenant, they must be physically circumcised. Now notice Galatians. If you get circumcised, don't do it, he said. Please don't do it. And I'm speaking to everyone, Paul said there. Is he really saying, well, I'm talking to the Jews now, now I'm talking to the Jews? I don't think so. His churches are mixed with Jews and Gentiles, and he's telling all of them, we are moving past, we have moved past the old covenant stipulation of physical circumcision. We've moved into the realm of the spirit. That takes us into Colossians chapter 2, where Paul is very scared that people are going to adopt the Jewish calendar, the new moons and the holy days and the weekly Sabbath. That's the totality of the Jewish calendar. They're going to adopt that. Don't do it, Paul says. These things are a shadow, and he contrasts them negatively with the Messiah who has come. Christ is your Sabbath. Let us be keeping the feast. Doesn't mean let's be observing one festival. Let's be festivalizing on a continuing basis. That's in 1 Corinthians 5. Look at the Greek carefully there. Look at the commentaries. Your rest is in Jesus, not just one day in the week. Now, it happens, of course, that the Christians observing not uh, as a Sabbath. Sunday is not a Sabbath, that's quite true. But Sunday is a reasonable day to rest, and so you get in 1 Corinthians 16 too, every first day of the week, note the Greek me and feminine there, implying day, every first day of the week, put your money in the treasury, so there'll be no collections, so there will be no collections when I come. That is rather obvious, that they are collecting the money in the church on every first day of the week. That's entirely reasonable. It's a falsehood to say that Constantine invented Sunday. Yes, he legislated in favor of the Christians who were keeping Sunday as a resurrection day. That's perfectly true. But Constantine did not invent that idea. So Romans 14, 14 and 20 are clinchers. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 is perfectly plain. Paul is against the shadows of the Jewish calendar. 
Okay, so the next one is... <coughs> Okay, someone told me that Jesus must be God because the Bible says he was worshipped. Matthew 2, 11, <laughs> okay. Matthew 14, 33. That's a great question. The Old Testament uses phrases like bow down to. Mm -hmm. Is that a form of worship? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a great question. Uh, 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 really a good one because the massive confusion here, massive confusion, one should simply know that to worship in the Bible, in the King James Version, is done of God and man. You can worship a dignified, superior human being. You can worship God. So the use of the word worship for any individual does not, I repeat, does not prove that that person is God. I've forgotten the verse off the top of my head. It's in First Chronicles 29, 20, I believe. Is it not there? I think so. First Chronicles, they worshipped God and the king. The king is not God. So it's a, it's a language confusion and muddle of enormous proportions not to understand that the word worship is a flexible term in Scripture. You do have the word latrevo, which in the New Testament happens to be used only of God, latrevo. But in some Old Testament uh, passages, you'll find latrevo, the Greek, meaning to serve the Son of Man. And we've found some cases outside in extra biblical writings where Latrevo is used of man. So there again, you cannot say Latrevo must always imply that the object of Latrevo is God, although in the New Testament that is so. What you must say is that proskineo, the other word for worship, is to bow down in front of somebody. It could be God, it could be man, a superior dignity. But the mistake is to say, oh, I've got the word worship. Well, now in your English, yes. The word worship probably implies God. You don't worship other than God. That is simply not so in biblical language. Any good commentary, any good lexicon will show you that to be true. Start with the one, uh, show that to be true. St start with the one there in First Chronicles, though, where the king and God are worshipped together. Okay, how can those, those at the second resurrection, yeah. I think it's Revelation 20, yes. be judged without having had the opportunity to correct their thinking or what they do? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question too. They obviously cannot be judged against a standard they couldn't possibly have known. This is the famous sliding scale doctrine. In John 15, Jesus said, to his opponents, to the, to the hostile Jewish establishment, he said, if I had not come and spoken to you, you would not be guilty. Is that clear? You would not be guilty. He says it twice there. But now that I've come and told you, I'm here as the unique spokesman of God, the unique son of God, begotten in the womb of Mary. I'm telling you the truth. Now the situation is quite new. You are responsible for believing what Jesus says. Think of the trillions upon trillions and trillions of human beings who have lived and died without even hearing the name of Jesus. They cannot be judged on the basis of how they dealt with Jesus. Therefore, they must be judged on a different scale. That would be Romans 2. There are Gentiles who don't have the Torah. They've never heard of Jesus. They've never had that standard put before them as we, I think, unusually do in, in, in an extraordinary way do in, in our day. Therefore, they're judged on a different standard. And there's something going on the right side of the ledger for them. They're not all damned for information they couldn't possibly have known. We call this the wider hope. So let God take care of them then. And Jesus in the second resurrection at the end of the thousand year period there. And they will be judged according to what they reasonably could have known. Then there will be perhaps a time of probation to see that they make good progress towards the truth which leads to salvation. Okay, can you explain the... Uh prophecy in Isaiah 65, 20 and 23 yeah. about children in the kingdom being... Yeah, well that's, that's wonderful. There will of course be a surviving mortal population in that thousand year reign, the beginning of the kingdom properly speaking, when Jesus comes back, yes the kingdom the, and the character of the kingdom, the spirit of the kingdom must be present in our lives now, all that's true. And the royal family in training is certainly a fact of the present. But the kingdom of God begins then when Jesus returns at the seventh trumpet 
and all the nations of the world then become the kingdom of God. It won't happen overnight, but by a process of re-education. Now, there are some who are mortals surviving into that time. How do I know that? In Revelation 2, 26, 27, as a reward to the church of Thyatira there, Jesus said, if you survive to the end, it's not once saved, always saved, if you persist to the end in good faith, then I will give you rulership over the nations. Ah, over the nations. This is not rulership over other Christians. That would be ridiculous. There are nations surviving into that time who do not gain immortality at the second coming. The saints, of course, of all the ages, the true believers of all the ages, are immortalized or caught up to meet the Lord at the same time if they're living at that time, otherwise resurrected from the sleep of death, Psalm 13.3. And there are surviving mortals then, and they will have to undergo the re-education process that will proceed in that thousand year time. They will be ruled and administered by the saints, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 clearly says, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? So there you have children, or they're considered children, if they die at 100 years old. That's not immortality. Let it be quite clear that the saints gain immortality at the second coming, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Those who belong to Messiah, including Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets who will be seen in the kingdom, they all gain immortality. They cannot be dying at 100 years old. This therefore logically has to be children being born to other mortals because immortals do not bear children. We know that from Luke 20. These are the children of mortals surviving into that thousand year period. And if somebody dies 100 years old, he will be considered quite young, even cursed for not living longer. So longevity then will be increased enormously, which is what we'd expect under those ideal conditions. So that would be the reason that for that marvelous text then in Isaiah 65, a very realistic picture of children being born to mortals in the future thousand-year reign initiated by the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so in a related question, mm -hmm. So, if that's the case, mm. to whom do the children being born belong to in Isaiah 54, uh, where it says, Sing, O childless woman, you mm. who have never given birth, mm -hmm. break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you who have never been in labor, mm -hmm. for the desolate woman now has more children mm -hmm. than the woman who lives with her husband, says Yahweh. Yes, and that's, that's an interesting... Is that the church? Or yes. The no, that, that is applied by Paul to the church, quite clearly. Paul solves that problem for us. He uses that in Galatians 4. And he's talking about the reduced state of the church now, desolate, not doing well. But in that future reign, of course, the church will be triumphant. It will be ruling the world. And the product children, I think, not in the physical sense of birth, but the spiritual children will be massive, of course. The results of all the work that's being done by the, the, the church, which is now a woman desolate, is going to be reversed entirely, I would think, in that uh, future kingdom condition. So that's not talking, I think, about children born of, of physical marriages. Also, oh, this is not in the kingdom, this passage. Well, it, it, it is. It's both. It's now the state of the church is desolate. That's now. But rejoice, because the children of the now desolate one will be increased hugely. So it's both present and the destiny is a complete reversal in the future. So massive production of spiritual children, now rather reduced perhaps. Yeah. Okay, so that's all the questions yeah. for now. Did you want to go into uh, Yeah, I think what we're finding on the internet is that people are not really convinced that the teaching of Jesus is absolutely critical in Christianity. I've got a couple of quotes I've been using. One of them from James Kennedy, who says something like this. Many people think that the teaching of Jesus is important. That's not true. What really is important is that God came and died for our sins. Now, I say that is fundamentally and systematically false. If one thing is clear, and there are many things that are very simple and clear in the New Testament, is that Jesus is the one through whom God is speaking. There's a voice from heaven, no less, which says, this is my beloved, my unique son, listen to him. Not just watch him die on the cross, that's of course vital. Not just watch him rise from the dead, that of course is vital. Listen to his teachings. 
But a curious dispensationalism lurks in the minds of a lot of people, such that they're not convinced that the teaching and words of Jesus are the foundation of our faith. Well, in Buddhism, you know, that what the Buddha says goes. In the Islamic faith, what Muhammad says goes. In Christianity, if this is not founded on the words of Jesus, everything has gone. The foundation of the faith is shaky. Now that leads us then to the first and great commandment when Jesus was asked by a friend of Jew in Mark 12, what is the greatest commandment we mustn't miss? And he comes out with a purely Jewish answer. But of course that's not only Jewish because it came from the lips of Christ. This is Christianized Judaism if you like. But I have to warn you that the church fathers in post-biblical times lost that. You can do some study here, but the church fathers, notably the Cappadocian fathers, who already engineered the detail of the later Trinity, unwittingly, no doubt, not on purpose, they say, we're rejecting the Jewish error. And we're giving you a midpoint between pagan polytheism and the Jewish error. Excuse me? The Jewish error, my dear friends, the Cappadocians, <laughs> happened to be the Shema of Israel, which Jesus found. So, if you want to obey Jesus, you start with the unitary monotheistic Shema in Mark 12. That's brilliantly simple. The Lord our God is one Lord. This is what held Judaism together. People died for this. You cannot then just brush that aside. And so one of the commentaries I read today said that the Shema is a pre-Christian creed. What? If it came from the lips of Christ, which it did, it's not pre-Christian, it's pure Christian. Now, it might be pre-Christian if you're comparing biblical Christianity with post-biblical Christianity. That's a different thing. As long as it, is, as it is the words of Jesus, it's fundamentally important for us. Jesus then goes on to ask them a question about the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. And that, of course, is not God sitting with God, but God with a human at his right hand. So he then immediately defines his own relationship towards God. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Did you want this on the prayer list? Yeah, let's do that, yes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, on, on uh, the future, this shouldn't be so hard. Matthew 24. Jesus has asked uh, a very clear question. What will be the sign of your parousia? We need to use that word, the second coming. Technical term. The arrival of Jesus in power and glory to rule the world. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now the end of the age, here's how you do your Bible study. You say, let me look at the end of the age. That phrase, the sintelia tuionos. Let me look in Matthew and see what he meant by it. Well, guess what? He meant the end of the age in the future to us, not 70 AD. That would throw the whole system into unutterable confusion if you start saying the parousia was in 70 AD. Because in Matthew 13, the end of the age is the harvest. It's the time when the true children of God shine like the sun in the strength, in its strength, in the kingdom of their father. That was in 70 AD. In the Great Commission, you are to go and teach all the teachings of Jesus and Paul, of course, and the rest of the New Testament, to the whole wide world, and I will be with you until 70 AD, heaven forbid, until the end of the age. The end of the age is a fixed datum in the New Testament. Nothing to do with the end of a Jewish age. That's an invention. That's a made-up phrase. The end of the age comes then from the language of Daniel 11 and 12, where a final king of the north, an anti-Christian figure, comes to his end in the area of Palestine and then follows the resurrection of the dead. If we lose track of these fixed points in the scheme, everything becomes total chaos. Yes, it's true. Jesus looked out on those buildings and threatened they would come to destruction, and they did. But the story he tells there, as it now turns out, was not a description of what happened in 70 AD. Precisely because there was no abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to. That's Mark 13, 14, in 70 AD. The church fled earlier, 66 or so, long before Titus invaded. But notice this very important point. Daniel 9, 
26b speaks of a wicked prince who destroys the city and the sanctuary and his end, the end of the life of that wicked prince will be with a flood of judgment. This will not fit at all, will not fit at all for 70 AD. It doesn't work. No, that's an anti-Christian figure. The Great Tribulation borders on the Second Coming. It's very close to the end. Jesus places the abomination of desolation standing where he, masculine pronoun, Mark 13, 14, not the Roman Empire, that's not a he, that's not a person, a single individual figure, the King of the North, when he sits where he shouldn't in a temple building, then flee, because that would be the time of unprecedented, unprecedented great tribulation. That's a reference to Daniel 12 in the same, 12, 1, in the same context exactly as the great tribulation. In other words, Jesus is building his whole story on the last chapters of Daniel there. And finally, in Daniel 12, 11, we learn that from the time that the abomination is set up until the end of the vision, which is the resurrection of the dead and the coming of Christ, there'll be 1290 days. That will not begin to work for a date in the first century. So, 926b of Daniel, look carefully. Mark 13, 14, look carefully, the masculine pronoun there. And above all, realize that Jesus is giving a description of his coming and end of the age. That's one idea. Yes, it included the destruction of the city in 70 AD. As it happens, there will be a yet future time of great tribulation to hit Israel. So this is not so hard, but the tendency of humankind to try to get rid of the future and put it in the past, a sort of our millennializing tendency, has really led to a mass of very confused material. Okay, this will finish there. No more questions? So That's great. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, at our site, we have, we have reference to my translation of the New Testament may find useful. Some of the notes here, especially the introduction, has quotes there along the lines of what we might call our Harnackian theory that things went wrong at the very beginning. And Harnack, yeah, here's the book that Carlos is kindly handing me here. Uh, the One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah translation. And in the introduction, you'll find what I think are some instructive quotations. Many historians, theologians and historians, have recognized that when from the second century the influence of Greek philosophy came upon the faith, everything changed. And the Reformation in the 1500s really didn't reverse some of that. So the technique is to go back to those early pre-150 AD days and see if we can't get something closer to the Jewish Jesus who never claimed to be God who did claim that God is one single person. And I'll read you one quotation from, to finish here, from this introduction. A British historian wrote this, the church diverged in discipline and dogma more and more widely from its ancient form, from its original New Testament form. Till in the second century, the Christians of Judea, who had faithfully followed the customs and tenets of the Twelve Apostles, were informed that they were heretics. Can you imagine that? Could it be that we're accusing Jesus of heresy when we force him into a Trinitarian environment about which he knew nothing? During that interval, a new religion had arisen. Christianity had conquered paganism, and paganism had corrupted Christianity. The legends which belonged to Osiris and Apollo had been applied to the life of Jesus. The single deity of the Jews, the Shema, to which I address, urge you to address your greatest attention, the first and greatest commandment, Mark 12, make sure you're really in line with it and obeying Jesus on that point. That unipersonal, unitary, strict monotheistic creed of Jesus had been turned into something else. And the man who had said to Jesus, why do you, or why, the man Jesus rather, who had said, why do you call me good? There's only one who is really good. But that man had now himself, by this corrupting influence, been made a god, or rather a third part of a god. That's a quotation from a historian. There are many like it. Get back to the New Testament, read Jesus in his Jewish, unitary, monotheistic environment. And I think you'll find the New Testament coming alive. So that's my translation with notes. 
the one God, the Father, one man, Messiah translation, available at Atlanta Bible College, 800-347-4261, or from Amazon. I think you'll find it interesting.